from service. All right. Well, welcome uh, back to our next sermon in our sermon series of the Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, this week, obviously, we're in week number six already. It feels like it's uh, insane that it's gone this fast uh, that we're in week number six already in this uh, short little series uh, out of Galatians 5 and this short two-verse uh, series. Uh, as we have started every week, we're going to start there again. So if you'll turn to Galatians 5, uh, verse 22 and 23, we'll read it together again uh, as we have every week and we've started every week. So Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. So we start that way every week because I want to remind ourselves each time what it is that we're talking about and what it is and whose power this is that we're going by is the fruits of the Spirit not fruit of yours, and not your fruit, but the fruits of the Spirit. Now let's think about a few things. When we think about becoming a Christian, we think about when we became a Christian, God gives you the Holy Spirit, right? When you walked and you accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you were given the Holy Spirit and it comes upon you. See, that is the reality of it. And those fruits are there for your taking, for your use. For your ability. But they don't just happen. You just don't magically wake up one day and be like, boom, I got it. I got all the power in the world and I can just start using it. Because it happens because you have then studied the Bible. You understand scripture. You understand what it means to live and breathe this life of being a Christian and understand what it means to walk in his light and live by his example. And then you start acting more and more like a Christian, and you start living it out like a Christian, and then magically, wow, you start acting more and more like Christ. Fruits of the Spirit are born out from that. So then Christ in you, and the Holy Spirit pours out from you. That is an amazing, an amazing thing that happens. But then just magically, at that campfire experience, you say, Man, I accept Jesus in my heart, and then magically the Holy Spirit just, boom, pours right out of you, because you need to understand what it means to be a believer. And as you understand what becomes a believer, the more and more your walk with Christ becomes that reality. The Spirit begins to change you internally, so that outpouring happens. You see yourself growing. You change. Sometimes we change our lives dramatically. I mean, some people who came to Jesus Christ say, man, I am changing my life. Maybe they're alcoholics, maybe they're drug addicts, and then like, they walk away from that lifestyle completely in a whole another way, which is what they should, right? And they don't even, you don't even recognize them. They look different. They act different. They talk differently. Obviously, if they were an alcoholic or a drug addict, right? I use the ex example of extremes on purpose. And you think about that, they start looking differently, talking differently, acting differently. Yes, because now, Jesus, now, Holy Spirit, now, God the Father is changing their life. And they are allowing themselves to be changed and transformed. But today, we're really talking about goodness. That is the spirit that we're in on today. Now, we're really going to be focusing on it today, but now, we've Use good all the time, right? How are you feeling today? Good. Good. How was that movie? Good. Good. How's that slice of berry, blueberry pie? Very good. We use good a lot of times, right? What about when we describe people? I have a good son. I have a good daughter. I have a good wife. See, we, we describe even people this way, right? Now, when we describe people, it's a descriptive. It's a little different. We're not describing just things. So we use it in a different manner. And we're going to find that with the Scripture, that might be a little bit more what we're talking about today. But put a pen in that. I'm going to come back to that. Because when we describe people, 
We're describing character and behavior. And that is where we're going to get into today with Scripture. Character and behavior. Because things are just things. They're good. They're abstract. They're good. Doesn't really mean much. Because if you ever heard that phrase of like, how are you feeling today? Good. Blueberry pie? Good. Good. You actually don't really, you usually don't follow up on it. Like, okay, thanks for telling me. You just kind of move on. But we t- describe somebody, it's a character, behavior, those type of things. That's what we're going to get into today with Scripture. We're going to notice that that is very descriptive of how we see and how God sees us. But as we do every week, we've got to start with the basics, right? We've got to define. We've got to define this word goodness. So, of course, as we have every week so far, we go to the 1828 Webster Dictionary, and it defines it as this, a state of being good. That seems like so easy to get to, right? A state of being good. Physical qualities. Value. Excellence. Perfection. Those kind of things. When you think of goodness. Now, interesting thing is it's very similar to kindness in a lot of ways. So a sentence to explain is if somebody was describing somebody's goodness to them. I shall remember his goodness to me with gratitude. Because people feel goodness. So that's a good way to understand how goodness is perceived. They feel goodness on them. So it's an interesting way to look at it. So we look at kindness. If it's close to kindness, as we talked about already, we see kindness as merciful, as something being done for them, right? So goodness can be part of that, but there's one big difference that we're going to talk about today. Goodness is definitely different than kindness, although similar. Goodness has different qualities than just doing something for somebody else. Kindness is doing something for somebody else. Goodness has a lot to do with you and your heart. Not just doing something for somebody. Goodness we're going to find a lot about ourselves. A lot about who you are. If goodness describes you, if goodness is something you're doing, if goodness is outpouring from you, then goodness is going to describe a lot about you. And after today, I think you're going to understand, it's going to describe a lot about what's in your heart. I hope. So today, let's not belabor too far on how the world describes goodness, but let's get into Greek class, as we do every week. So let's look at, I forgot to put the the Greek word in here for you, uh, but uh, I apologize for that. Um, but if we were to spell it out here, it would be agatha sone. So agatha sone is the Greek word, um, and it's defined to do good. Super simple. To do good. But now, now shouldn't that describe anybody? How is that a fruit of the Spirit? Shouldn't that just be anybody does good? So now... Now, Teddy, are you saying that anybody does good goes to heaven? Now, you got to be careful, right? we got to be very careful not to just throw throw around the idea that anybody does good must be going to heaven. Because that is definitely not what we're talking about here. We're talking about to do good. And we've also talked about how it's already describing something about you and your heart, right? Where is your heart? How have we always described that? It's already in conjunction with Jesus, right? We've already talked about somebody who's been, who is a believer, who understands who Jesus is. We also understand that it's about accepting Jesus Christ. Already understand that this is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit from you, right? All these descriptives that are very important for us to understand. So when we do that and understand that, we can see that it's to do good, which is an outpouring of from you. It's the intrinsic, intrinsic good. The intrinsic good. 
the goodness from within that pours out. Now, how many people do we know that just has like, they're just, they beam with goodness. I mean, you can just tell. They have just goodness all about them. Most of us would describe one or two people in our life that maybe just you'd say, man, they are whew, good to the core. You can just tell. But honestly, it's not one of those qualities that just kind of just beam out of everybody. But you can tell somebody has a goodness by when they actually act, by when they do it, when they care for you, when they're doing something good, it pours out of them in a different way. It pours out in a goodness nature that is drastically different. It is not the righteous nature. It's not doing something for righteous sake. It is doing something because of qualities of the heart and mind. Now, as we look at this, we'll just kind of describe what commentaries say about goodness before we get into our example today, right? We're going to describe what these commentaries are saying. Describe what differences are throughout describing goodness of all the different examples we can come to. God used the word good also, didn't he? He used good quite a bit. He even used good in the very beginning of the Bible for us. The very beginning of the Bible. Let's just start with creation. If we were to evaluate creation, you simply look at every single day, he said it was good. Same word. Every single day, he said it was good. Same word. Except for on the seventh day, he said it was very good. So I'm wondering if he was thinking of blueberry pie at that day. Because I think of blueberry pie is very good. All right, so we think of very good. Last day, very good. Think about that explanation of good word. It's very good. But when we describe people, it really does come down to that character, behavior, because that is where the Bible truly looks at this word good from. The goodness of the Bible refers to uprightness of the heart. Uprightness of the heart and life. See, that is the difference. It's not just you are good, and so then you must have the fruit of the Spirit of goodness. See, if good people went to heaven, then, man, there would be a lot of people in heaven who don't believe in Jesus Christ. That is not the quality we're talking about. And not everybody that does good things is doing it from a good perspective. It is a perspective that needs the Holy Spirit to guide and direct them. Because it's not about them at all. It's not doing it from a place of righteousness. It's doing it just because. It needs done. It is a perspective that is necessary. When we look at that goodness and kindness, as I've said it before, it is that graciousness, that kindness, the generosity towards others, which kindness has. But the difference is, truly, that goodness has that purity of heart in it. Truly far greater has nothing to do with them and everything to do with the person receiving. Jess wants to do good on behalf of God from their heart. Remember, when we discuss all these fruits of the Spirit, it is everything to do with the relationship with Jesus. Everything to do with the connection to Him. The deeper your relationship to him, the more rooted your relationship is. The more your heart is centered on Jesus, the more the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, will work through you. So let's look at our example today. I think you might enjoy it. And I did not update my slides, so we're going to ignore them for the rest of the way through 
and I'm going to blame that on a eight-month-old that regressed in his sleeping <laughs> and is very annoying right now. So I'm going to go back to my notes and forget the slides. Um, I don't have to be distracted by them now, thankfully. All right, back to track. All right, so the first slide I would have had here is a reminder, a warning, and a lead into the, lead to the example this week. Your first is a reminder. See, last week we learned from Christ's example that sometimes you have to discern when, you know, when do people actually want help. Remember? Sometimes it's okay to not help people. Sometimes it's okay to walk away from people. Sometimes it's okay to leave people there. It's okay. Jesus did it. Jesus walked away from people. We all know that they need help. We can see it. We can see it a mile away. But it's okay to leave them there if they're not ready for help. Perfectly fine. We learned from his perfect example that it's okay to walk away sometimes. But a warning comes from that as well. And the warning is this. In this week's example, what we have to learn from that is that the warning is this. We must guard ourselves against using the truth that it's okay to walk away to avoid ever going back. Because sometimes people need us to go to them. Sometimes people do need us to go to them. We can't use that truth that it's okay to walk away from them to never go to them. Oh, I just think they don't want it. I just think they're not ready for it. See, see how we distort the truth sometimes? We can't use that truth because it is truth, right? It's just distorted a little bit. See, we distort our own brains to suit our own purposes. We can't distort that truth. That's your warning. As a Christian, as a believer, don't distort the truth. The truth is the truth. You are acceptable absolutely 100% in your Christian walk to walk away from someone who's not ready for, to accept Jesus Christ, who is not ready to change of their ways. 100% the truth. But don't distort that to the point where you say, well, I don't think they're ready. Air quote. Because the warning is that you would not, definitely not, be using the goodness of God in your fruit of the Spirit. You'd be saying they're too far gone. So when we lead into today's example, we're going, to be, we're going to be exploring the story of a man who by all appearances was so far removed from all humanity that he literally lived among the dead, haunted in a graveyard, a crazy madman, and from Scripture, we know his name to be Legion. That is our example today that we'll move into. So if you want to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, that is our next piece of Scripture we'll be going to. Luke chapter 8, 26 through 39 is our Scripture we'll be going to. But first you might be thinking, why are we talking about Legion when we're talking about goodness? What a story to go to. Well, let me give you my reason. Evil to goodness. When you start the story, all we see is evil. When we look at the end of the story, all we see is goodness. For me, it's easy to get there. But also, it might take the end of the story before, and in the sermon before we actually get there. He was a demon-possessed man. Evil to goodness. Legion. It doesn't seem like they go together, but they truly do. Living death, who lived alone in graveyards, isolated from everywhere, more beast than man. It would be easy for us all to assume, easy for us all to assume that he definitely was not searching for Jesus. He was definitely not running out of the caves going, Hey, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? I need to find him. He was not searching for Jesus.
But Jesus was searching for him. Jesus went to him. So let's read the story. 26 through 39. When they sailed to the region of Gerizines, which is opposite of Galilee, when he got out of the land, a demon-possessed man from the town met me. When a long time he had worn no clothes and did not stay in the house. But in the tombs, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and said in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High, God, I beg you, don't torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And through, though he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints he had been given and the demon into uh, deserted places. What is your name? Jesus asked him. Legion, he said, because many demons had entered him and they begged him not to banish him to the abyss. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs and he gave them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the men who tended them saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it to town in the countryside. The people went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man the demons had departed from, sitting in Jesus' feet, dressed and in the right mind, and they were afraid. Meanwhile, the witnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. Then all the people of the Gerizim region asked him to leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he returned. The man from whom the demons had departed begged him earnestly to be with him. But he sent him away and said, go back to your home and tell all that God had done for you. And off he went, proclaiming throughout the town how much Jesus had done for him. When we look at this passage, there's so much in this scripture that we can speak to. We can speak to how many different messages are in this, really. But we stay focused on the peace that is legion. He was a man that was useless, aimless, purposeless, alive, but no more good of value than those dead and buried in the graveyard that he called home. But then what? What happened? What changed? It was Jesus. That's what changed his life. That's what transformed him. That is what made the difference to everything he did. That is the difference in everything and everyone. How do we apply this to our lives, though? How do we transform our lives? How do we transform our lives based on this story right here? How do we look at this and say, what can be different about my life knowing the story of Legion? First, Never assume the worst of the worst. Never assume that those that are the worst in your life don't want help. Because the reality is, some of them might. There are going to be those in your life that don't want help. That's just, that's just reality. But there are going to be those that really do want help. Don't pursue to the point, as we talked about last week, to where you find yourself in a trap. But it's okay to reach out. Never take the worst of the worst. It isn't capable of restoration. Everybody is. 
I'm telling you what, like there is no one, no one beyond restoration. And again, I mentioned it in prior sermons, it is awful sometimes to think about some of the most inhumane things to think about. There is no one beyond Jesus' love. Because we can think about some pretty inhumane things. But there really is the fact. There's no one beyond Jesus' love. And that's hard for us to grasp. But in true repentance and true reality, there's no one beyond Jesus' love. And never assume God's goodness can't bear fruit in the most unlikely of places. Through the most unlikely people, he is the good God who resurrects and restores. He truly is. So when we look at that, we move into our wrap-up this week. How do you wrap up a sermon like that? We talk about the goodness of God. We talk about legion. We talk about how Jesus transformed his life, totally transformed from evil to goodness. It just doesn't seem to make sense. But it really is. It's so important just to focus on the basics of what it is. It really is that simple. The fruit of goodness is not just doing good things. Because that would be simple. We all desire to do good things. I mean, I want to do good things. But that is not what the goodness of God is. It's about doing good things. Because you have a good heart. And that good heart starts with your belief and trust in Jesus Christ. And your belief and trust in Jesus Christ is transformed because the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, they are transforming you and pushing out from you the goodness through the Spirit. I will add... That it is a heart that is good and it is focused on Jesus. Because like I said, there's a lot of good people in the world doing good things. But one who has the fruit of goodness is one who has a heart that is for Jesus first. Period. Not the other way around. There is no other way that the fruit of the spirit of goodness is being used. In any other way. And one last reminder of what we've already talked about today is the more your heart is centered on Jesus, the more the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit of goodness will work through you. So today we'll wrap up early, as I've been promising for weeks, uh, so that we can do a little bit of sermon follow up before we go into our lunchtime. So let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for all you do for us. We're so grateful for your encouragement, your guidance, and your direction. Father, may you give us all just the uh, um, grace we need and the patience we need and just the uh, focus we need to be able to uh, utilize the goodness uh, that the Holy Spirit brings in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll take an opportunity to do... uh,